Eric, how do I pronounce your name? Hefto. Eric, what's your current or recent academic position? Well, I've recently retired from what was known as Lesius in, mm -hmm. in Antwerp, which then was renamed for a short while as Thomas More, and which has now become part, an integral part of the Faculty of Letters in the University of Lund. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've retired uh, recently from that institute, uh, so I'm a sort of uh, what you would call emeritus uh, Good. professor. Good. But what was your job uh, before retiring? Uh, my, my job was um, was, was twofold. Um, I did a lot of uh, what was called cultural studies in the curriculum. So I mean, you know, background to the UK, background mm -hmm. to the United States, because I was in the English section. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing, uh, as a teaching load, essentially, was uh, was doing interpreting, interpreting mm -hmm. English Dutch. Mm -hmm. uh, and besides that, that's a sort of a third thing uh, that was. Uh, um, there was a great deal of focus on European Union projects, but we, we might come to that as a separate topic. No, I, I'm interested in that in your work as a researcher, because we we see your name on some important documents concerning yeah. legal translation. Exactly. And, well, and interpreting. Yeah, legal interpreting. Yeah, interpreting. Yeah, more, yeah. Um, well, um, that began really was an outcome of um, an invitation in the 1990s, mid 1990s when we were invited as an institute to go to South Africa uh, and train the trainers uh, for the Through Time Reconciliation Commission. And we came back from South Africa and we're wondering, you know, we're, we're providing essentially legal interpreting training in mm -hmm. South Africa, but what about Belgium or what about other EU countries or what about the EU as such? You mean there was no training? There was no, there was no real interest here at that time mm -hmm. in legal interpreting training or, or, you know. And as it happened in 1998, um, the European Commission launched uh, a first call for action grants for projects uh, on issues like procedural safeguards mm -hmm. in, uh, in the judiciary. And for the first time, as it happened, they mentioned legal interpreters and translators as a, as a category they would particularly address as becoming part of this procedural safeguards uh, framework. And we responded to that. We submitted uh, a project. So that, that was in 1998. Uh, and since then, it, it snowballed in the sense that this first project, which was called Equitas, then became the foundation materials of a green paper on procedural safeguards. Um, and we then began to work very much in, in, in tandem mm -hmm. with the DG Justice, the Director of okay. General Justice within the European Commission. For example, let me give you two other examples. Um, at one point, uh, the, well, the green paper evolved into a framework, into a proposal mm -hmm. for a framework decision. That was uh, buried by the member states or by some of the member states because at that time it was still required unanimity among the member states mm -hmm. on a framework decision. And six member states opposed the proposed framework decision. And so the Commission said, you know, how can we convince the member states to go along with this initiative? And so that is when we did a status question on mm -hmm. legal interpreting and translation in the member states. Uh, in response to sort of you know support their argument, there is a need for you know um, quali uh, quality legal interpreting and translation as part of procedural safeguards. Um, and then at the later stage, let me give you a final example. At the later stage, uh, the DG Justice or the European Commission felt a need um, for a spokes body of the legal interpreters and translators because they were meeting with uh, judges mm -hmm. and they were meeting with uh, probation officers or with uh, police uh, representatives. But there was no body they could talk to that represented the legal interpreters and translators because, I mean, FIT or IEP or whatever, they are international mm -hmm. 
they're not European associations, and so they wanted a particular European association. And so that's when we, in another EU project, that's when we founded and established EULITA, yes. which was the European Legal Interpreter and First Aiders Association. Um, and uh, then, uh, well, 2010 is then the, the turning point because that saw the uh, passing of the directive for right. translation interpreting, which is which is a crucial uh, uh, development in the sense that uh, after the Treaty of Lisbon, we were now able to have directives in judicial matters rather than framework decisions. And directives, of course, are binding on member states. Uh, as to the content and the purpose of the directive, uh, it's left to the member states as to the ways they're going to implement it. But the, the content and the purpose uh, has to be has to be implemented. Right, that's, that's, a crucial, thing, uh, that's a crucial. Uh, yeah, point. Yeah. it's it's a twelve year. It's a it's a twelve year. year. Yeah, yeah. You, but you're it's the, part you're of the package. Research. If I may interrupt, yes. sorry. You're the lead researcher on. All those projects. Uh, I wouldn't you're, you're, call you're myself. I wouldn't call document. myself a, a researcher. I, I, it, it's almost. I mean, without sounding presumptuous, it's almost like a policy maker, policy developer. That's what interests me as well, yeah. because you're a trainer, an academic, yeah. who's come into into, into, into governance, into policy making, yeah. and, and you've had an effect. Yeah. On European policy, yeah. I remember. I remember a particular instance um, because I mean, all interpreting within the European Commission is, in a sense, associated with SCIC, right? mm -hmm. conference interpreting, yes. providing interpreting to the Parliament or the services of the Commission. And um, I was invited uh, at one one of these university SCIC university conferences, which are annually held, and I was invited to to give a speech about, you know. Uh, what I was doing, and I mean, they were so surprised that there were all these projects about interpreting within the DD Justice, which SCIC, the interpreting body within the Commission, actually didn't know about at that time. There was interpreting going on in medical services, which had the support or at least the interest of other uh, uh, DGs within the within the Commission. And so, for example, at one, point, at one point, I was then invited by the uh, then Commissioner for Multilingualism, Monsieur Orban, uh, the, the Hungarian Commissioner, mm -hmm. uh, who called together a uh, reflection forum on interpreting. It's a misleading title because it was really a reflection forum mm -hmm. on legal interpreting. Mm -hmm. And what it set out in like, you know, 12, 15 pages were the basic essential guidelines on implementing and providing quality service in legal interpreting. So, uh, so th th there, is some, there is some research in the sense that you know, all these projects are carried out by a consortium. Well, you, you pointed out what was happening on the ground outside of Brussels. Oh, yeah, yeah, so very much. That, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. that's yeah, ground yeah, data yeah. gathering, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, it was more using the available research and turning it into policy guidelines and policy recommendations. So when I look at all these EU projects in legal interpreting, when I look at the reflection forum and when I look at your data, I would say it's, it's more like you know policy making okay. rather, rather than academic research. Yeah. Can we go back to when you were in your mid twenties <laughs> or so? What were you doing there? It's a long time from, re from retirement to back to mid twenties. Oh, Memories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did so you have a legal memories. background? Yeah. How did you get into? into That's a long story. Uh, how much time do you have? A couple um, of minutes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I studied here in Leuven, where we were having this interview, uh, and I studied Germanic philology, uh, which was uh, three languages: Dutch, English, and German. Uh, you could drop one in the third year. So this was the old license, mm -hmm. the four-year program. Could drop one in the third year, but I carried German along for what, in one or two optional um, subjects, and you could take on a Scandinavian language as a fourth language, uh, and I did some Norwegian uh, at the time. But this was a very traditional philological mm. curriculum, you know, doing Gothic and Indo-Germanic philology and sound changes and vowel changes. You have it. 
Um, so your, your training was as a linguist? My tra no, my training was as a literature uh, oh, okay. guy. Okay. And, um, but there was one optional course in the third year, which was called American Literature. It was a weird course, uh, taught by the only professor at the time who had been to the United States, but he was actually a medievalist, and he taught American <laughs> Literature. And I did my dissertation on American Literature, because that was, that was a, a, a new thing. The, in the 60s, we're mm -hmm. talking 60s, yeah. and that was a brand new thing, American literature. I did modern American literature, which was unheard of. And then when I when I got my my degree, uh, this professor said, you know, well, I can offer you an assistantship, uh, but on one condition that you're doing Middle English, because there's no future in American literature. <laughs> and there was a middle English. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So what happened was that uh, I started this PhD research in medieval English literature, on Chaucer particularly. And as it happened, of course, this was as could be predicted, you know, the old literature was slashed time and again mm -hmm. over the years as the curriculum was reformed. And a couple of years later, American literature became a chair in its own right. And, you know, these are the ironies uh, of life, but I, I did then, I did then, uh, I, I, I did the PhD on, on Chaucer, mm -hmm. uh, but while the curriculum was being slashed, I then sort of, you know, compensated for the slashes here by going into first the teacher's training college, and then uh, ended in Antwerp in the uh, translation, interpreting translation department. And when I was hired, as again as it happened, the coincidences of life, uh, the colleague uh, who was uh, training, who was teaching interpreting English Dutch, uh, resigned. And we were hired as a, as a team. Uh, one was a professional interpreter who did the simultaneous English Dutch. And I was asked, uh, it was just part of the package that I had to accept. I was asked to um, do the consecutive. Uh, had you interpreted? No, no, no. no. no but they thought, you know. The guy probably has some sort of, you know, analytical, synthetic mind. So, okay. you know, trans transferring the essence of a message to another language well, no, would probably work. Well. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought it was, I thought it was challenging. It was interesting. And over the years, uh, I really became extremely interested in, in interpreting. And what I tried to do uh, was to, because I was the only really academic in that bunch of practitioners. Okay. Yeah? So what I tried to do was to internationalize the environment, uh, bring in speakers and specialists from outside, from Vienna or wherever, mm -hmm. uh, and have at the same time our students at least once a year visit another interpreting institute just to participate mm -hmm. in the training for, for a week or so. The other thing was to uh, start interpreting studies, you know, okay. build a library, build a collection, uh, around the interpreting study, so make it a more scholarly, academic uh, undertaking at the same time. And the third thing, and this is where the, the link comes in with what we discussed first, and the third thing was to open up conference interpreting or interpreting, besides some young conference interpreting to public service, community, mm -hmm. legal yeah. interpreting, medical as interpreting, a whole, uh, as a whole new relation. terrain which was yeah. alien to these practitioners mm -hmm. who were all working for the European Commission or the Parliament or the freelance or the market, but who are really conference interpreters. Yeah. And so opening opening up that, that spectrum was, mm -hmm. was, was was extremely interesting and that's that provided that link then to, to legal interpreting. Uh, I'm interested in, in Belgium. Certainly I, I did research on this in the nineteen nineties when you had professional training of interpreters and translators in in institutes yeah. that were very separate from an academic yeah. institution yeah. in Leuven, yeah. this was the academic yeah. institution yeah. that didn't train no. professionals, no. and they yeah. did. Yeah. Research was done here and not there. Yeah. Now yeah. I come and you're all part of one system. That's a, that's that, a, that's a, yeah, that's, is that, that's, is that it? That's what's happened? Or? That's, that's true. I mean, that's, that's a fair sketch of, of the, of the evolution. And that's an advance? Well, uh, I'm not so sure, um, in the sense that uh, when I came into this institute in Antwerp, this interpreting translation mm -hmm. institute in Antwerp in the 1980s then, uh, we were the first cohort of PhDs. 
because uh, as teachers, as right? teachers, as, as trainers, trainers yeah, yeah. in the sense that they wanted to up, upgrade, as right. it were, the quality of the teaching and bring in some, you know, some more scholarly, some yeah, some skills beyond the mere practice, as it were, the professional practice. But that's been a struggle for quite a while. Uh, I would say that for about 10, 15, 20 years, uh, there, there were probably two camps, two mm -hmm. sides, you know. One that was pushing towards more academic prestige and recognition and, you know, research and so on. And the others that were uh, looking towards the practical skills of interpreting, mm -hmm. getting a job in interpreting right. or getting a job as a translator. And uh, these two fractions or these two groups sometimes clashed in, in curriculum development or in appreciation of students, you know, uh, mm -hmm. skills and, 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 uh, and, and, and professional uh, uh, prospects. Has um, that been resolved now? That's been, that's, that's been resolved by also a governmental policy that has merged right. these uh, higher education institutes into the universities. Well, for, first what they did was to, they, they built these, these larger conglomerates of um, consisting of a university and a number of institutes of higher education. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the first step was this sort of conglomerate structure, and then uh, they split and separated these institutes of higher education into professional bachelor programs, let's say speech therapy or whatever, uh, and the uh, old four-time curricula, curricula were merged with the faculties of universities. Mm -hmm. So our program in uh, translation and interpreting really became, since last Into year, part of this uh, okay. faculty of letters here in Leiden. Final question. Uh, what kind of research do you think we should be doing? Or if you were beginning, entering now to do research on, on interpreting and translation? That's a, very it's a very difficult question. Uh, I would say probably the first uh, line of research should probably be uh, along interdisciplinary line, mm -hmm. uh, lines. Uh, I was thinking of a recent um, PhD uh, by Shaka Timaroma, who did uh, a very interesting PhD on uh, memory in uh, but she brought to that PhD, through her own reading, but also with the, with the help of others, she brought a great deal of um, statistics, psychology, neurology, etc., mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, into studying that particular problem. So I think interdisciplinary, uh, whether it's interdisciplinary, for example, looking at public service interpreting, uh, we, we need sociological uh, inroads, we need economics, uh, for example, let's say, uh, if you wanted to study the impact of translation or interpreting on integration, as we were just mm -hmm. discussing uh, this afternoon, uh, then uh, you need particular interdisciplinary methodologies. So that's, I think, one yeah. line. The other line that I see as a particularly fruitful one is uh, is uh, a more but now I'm looking particularly at, um, at public service interpreting is to and maybe it's a variant on the in, on the interdisciplinary but it is um, looking it's like an eco, what I would call an ecological kind of research namely does the research mirror real life uh, settings and situations. Um, and then I would be thinking, for example, of uh, interpreting in, in hospitals, but with the feedback from patients, service mm -hmm. providers, medical personnel, etc., etc., or in legal interpreting. Uh, we have a PhD coming up uh, a couple of months from now in November. And uh, she, Emmanuel Gallet, uh, she was able to. Uh, 
uh, take the court a whole uh, murder trial uh, and then analyze it in its longitudinal mm -hmm. uh, development and interpret the trial, of course, uh, here in Belgium. Um, and that is a sort of link between uh, interpreting studies on the one hand and forensic studies on mm -hmm. the other. So again, it's it's a kind okay. of variant on this interdisciplinary thing. This is highly descriptive. It's right. uh, it's it's highly descriptive. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it's a sort of you know ethnographic yes. uh, study of what's there, what what happens there, but uh, bringing in a, a huge array of methodological instruments to try and understand mm -hmm. what it is that that is happening. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure.